Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on digital audio conversion, Let's Go Digital, presented by Al Crane. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like, to take, we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Al Crane, the presenter for today's webinar. Al has worked in the AV industry for more than 20 years, including roles at SeaWorld and various AV inverters before becoming a technical trainer for Harman in 2008. With a passion for high fidelity sound reproduction and course instruction, Al holds CompTIA TA CTT Plus and Avixa CTS certifications. And now I'll pass the mic over to you, Al. All right, thank you for that, Laura. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so today we're gonna talk about um, why we wanna convert from analog to digital, and then why we have to convert back from digital back to analog. And then we'll also talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, kind of the, the theory of, of exactly how that's done. So let's jump in here. Um, in order to start, we need to cover a couple of the terms here real quickly. Um, I'll be throwing out some, some acronyms that'll pretty much be used throughout the rest of this course. So I just want to cover those really quickly. Um, so the two terms, sample frequency and sample rate, you're going to hear those a lot during this um, presentation and pretty much any time you're talking about digital audio. Um, that's one of the key components or metrics for uh, measuring the quality is the sample frequency. Uh, I tend to refer to it as a sample frequency, uh, but others may refer to it as a sample rate. And the abbreviation for uh, the sample frequency is F sub S. Um, and you're going to find both these terms used interchangeably throughout the industry. Uh, next up is bit depth. <clears throat> Excuse me. A uh, bit depth is the word length. Uh, it's simply put, it's the number of bits in one sample or number of bits per sample. Uh, the bit rate, um, you may have heard this before talking about like MP3 files. Um, that's a common uh, unit of measure for the quality of an MP3, like 128 kilobits per second or 250 kilobits per second. So that's basically just the sample frequency multiplied by the bit depth, and that gives you the total number of bits for a given time period. So um, the total bit rate is expressed in bits per second, or more commonly, and especially in the pro audio world, it's going to be megabits per second as opposed to kilobits per second. An MP3 is probably going to be expressed as a kilobits per second, but in all the pro audio world, we pretty much stick to megabits per second of uh, quality. <clears throat> so this is a common one that we're going to talk about today. It's the analog to digital converter, and that's abbreviated as ADC. Uh, you may also see this written as A slash C. And then we have the, the DAC, the digital to analog converter. And that's pretty much the common way this is um, abbreviated for a DAC. So DAC stands for Digital to Analog Converter. And DAC could mean a couple things. It could be the actual algorithm that's used to convert from digital back to analog, or it could be talking about the chipset that's used, or it could be talking about the full finished good product um, of the actual analog to di digital to analog convert. <clears throat> and then lastly, we'll talk about LPCM linear pulse code modulation. So there are different ways of encoding analog audio into digital, uh, but the most common way and the way we're going to talk about today is what's called linear pulse code modulation. So simply put, all sound is an analog waveform. And when that sound is captured by a microphone, that microphone transmits the sound into your system via the analog waveform. It's just a very small voltage that gets passed along the system. And even still today, there are some purely analog systems. You could have your analog microphone sending a signal into an analog microphone preamplifier, 
the preamplifier then steps up the voltage from, you know, maybe a tenth of a volt to one full volt, for example. Uh, but that's all can be done in the analog realm. And then maybe that signal, that preamp, would then send the signal into an equalizer, and it could be an analog rack mounted equalizer, a graphic EQ or a PIMIC EQ, and then so on and so on down the chain. And the entire signal chain could just be analog. The amplifier is going to process the audio as analog, and then it goes out to the loudspeaker, and it has to actually go out to the loudspeaker as analog. Um, loudspeakers only work in analog. Um, if you would like more information on that, um, you can attend the upcoming auto design course on May 28th, and I'm going to dig deep into, into how a loudspeaker actually takes the analog sine wave and converts that to sound. So what effectively happens here is we are going to what's called sample this waveform. So each blue dot you see on the right-hand image, that is a single sample taken of the waveform. And I think it's pretty obvious and pretty clear here visually that the more samples you take, the better the end result is going to be. And that's what we're shooting for here. So we want lots of samples uh, taken very frequently. Now, of course, this sine wave I have up here as an example, just to keep the math simple, is just one hertz, right? So this is one complete cycle over a period of one second. And of course, in the audible spectrum, we have frequencies from 20 hertz all the way to 20,000 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. So, you know, this would, you would definitely want a lot more samples if you're sampling a much higher frequency like 20,000 hertz as opposed to one hertz. So for our simple example here, um, we're going to talk about the CD, the compact disc, and how audio is brought into the digital realm from the analog sine wave. So let's just take one of our samples as an example here. So this looks like it's the fifth sample we're taking of this sine wave. And remember, this sine wave is representing the actual analog music. So this is just one brief moment in time that we're capturing of that sine wave. So what we're doing here is we are taking a measurement at a given point in time. That measurement is called a sample. And then I'm going to convert that voltage because that's all we have here, left-hand side here, you have a voltage. Generally, it's, it's plus or minus one volt is the scale that we would use. So, for example, maybe at the very top, this is one volt, and down here at the bottom, it's negative one volt. And then up here, you know, maybe this is 0.8 volts, for example. So I'm going to take this voltage measurement, and then I'm going to convert that into the digital bit value for that voltage. If it's 0.852 volts, then I'm just going to convert 0.852 to the um, binary equivalent of that. And this is what computers are very good at. Computers are very good and very fast at taking an analog value, converting it to the binary equivalent. That's what computers do. They convert things to, to binary. That's all computers know are ones and zeros. So a computer is very efficient at this. So if we're talking about the compact disk here, the sample frequency, and let me just bring up my annotation here real quick. So the sample frequency for compact disc is 44,100 hertz. Um, oftentimes you'll see this written as 44.1 kilohertz. And that's the way it's written. So lowercase k for kilo, h for hertz, and then of course a lowercase d. So that is the sample frequency. That's how many samples there are of one second of our music. So it, another way of saying that is every 44 thousandth of a second, we take a new sample of that waveform. And we just convert that sample value, that voltage value, into the binary equivalent to convert it to binary. 
Just stop annotating for a second. All right, so oops, let me get through all these. All right, so now we're going to put some more annotations up here. And I'll rewrite that. I'm just going to write the shorthand method, which is 44.1 kilohertz. And then next is the bit depth. And for CD quality sound, we always sample at 16 bits. That means that there are 16 ones and zeros in each sample that we take of our waveform. And then for the total here, we just multiply 44.1 kilohertz times 16. So, and that's going to give you a number roughly of 1.411 megabits per second. So that is and by the way, this is for two-channel stereo, so I didn't mention that, but you get basically 720 kilobits for left channel, 720 kilobits for right channel. You add those together, and then you get a total of 140 or 1.411 megabits for one second of music. So that is what's called the bit rate for CD quality sound. So if you want to put this into perspective, an MP3 file, a typical MP3 file that maybe you're streaming or you're downloading, um, that would be more likely 128 uh, kilobits per second. k. So you can kind of see that basically CD quality is a factor of 10 better than 128 kilobit mp3 file well i think that kind of you know brings to the forefront here the significant difference in quality from an mp3 that you're streaming um, up to cd quality sound and then of course in the poetry world we go way beyond um cd quality and we'll talk about that in a few minutes so here are some examples of various different uh, bit rates all the way down to 22 kilohertz 8-bit. Um, if you visit a web page, that's most likely how the audio was encoded. Um, it's very small file sizes and, you know, when web pages were first being developed, they wanted to minimize the bandwidth. So uh, we were only using 8-bit audio, which is basically half of what CD quality was. Uh, then we have digital audio tape. Uh, this is actually 4 millimeter tape and they upped it to 32 kilohertz at 16-bit. Then we moved to the CD quality sound. This was built in the, in the early 80s by Sony and Philips, and they used 44.1 at 16-bit. Uh, the reason it's 44.1 is that's just more than two times the maximum frequency you want to record, which in our case is 20 kilohertz. So we want to be more than 20 kilohertz, which is 40 kilohertz, and then there needs to be some overhead above that. So we then come into 48 kilohertz at 16-bit. Um, this is where you're going to find most recordings if it's for video. So any type of professional video recording, they're going to capture the audio at 48 kilohertz 16-bit. Then you move into HD audio. So this is where the pro audio world exists, where, which is what Harman is. So the Harman pro audio world, pretty much everything in Harman is going to support 48 kilohertz 24 bit depth or better. As an example, in the pro audio world, um, if any of you familiar with the Big Ben Master Clock, well, that's the default setting in a Big Ben is 4824. And that's how I'm going to abbreviate it the rest of this course. I'm going to say 4824. And you should know that that means 48 kilohertz sample frequency with a 24 bit depth. Uh, next up is 9624, which is just doubling the sample frequency the number of samples taken per second. So FLAC files, WAV files, uh, those support 9624. And then also 
DVDs can support up to 9624 as well. Then we move up to the final version, which is 19224. So this is DVD audio for stereo only. So if you're only doing stereo two channel, then you can go up to 192.24 on a DVD. So if you ever see a DVD audio, maybe someone has recorded an album. Um, for example, there's an Eagles album that was recorded um, onto DVD audio, which would not play in a CD player, um, but it would play in a DVD player, and it's DVD audio encoded in stereo, 192.24. Um, also, uh, the Blu-ray um, PCM encoding can do multi-channel 192.24, and then the two big standards out there are Dolby True HD and then DTS HD Master Audio, and they also can encode up to 192.24. So in the world of Harman, uh, we have analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion uh, for some of our products. So for example, uh, this is a DVX-376. This is basically a mic free. Um, it has obviously analog audio in. It's a vacuum tube amplifier, and then it has digital and analog out. So it can basically convert it or keep it in the analog realm, whichever you prefer. If you're going to digital, you can select the sample rate uh, which could be 96 kilohertz, 88.2, 48, or down to 44.1 kilohertz. Um, also, the bit depth is also selectable on the 386, and there are three choices there for bit depth. And I was going to um, do the math here, but you guys can figure out what, what the math is. Remember, all you're doing is you're taking the sample frequency, right, so 96,000, times 24, and that would give you the total bit depth. So if we do some simple, I'll do one of them, and then you guys can do the others on your own time if you like. Find out what these values are. But So for a simple one here, you would just say, um, let's, do, let's do the largest one. So 96,000, multiply that times 24, it's 24 bits, and then we can do some quick math here. Remember, this is just for one channel of audio. This is a one channel script. So that was what you'd be getting on the output of this device. So 96,000 times 24 bits. Uh, that's 2.3 megabits per channel. Approximately 2.3 megabits per second for one channel of audio. So that's, and then also you can do the same thing on VSS audio, um, if you're using the modular series, the frames with the custom um, cards, uh, those support 96 kilohertz as well. All the fixed I.O. devices from VSS support 48 kilohertz. And then in all of VSS, everything is fixed at 24 bit depth. And if you're looking at the Crown DCI series amplifiers, uh, those support 96 or 48. And again, the the word length or the bit depth is fixed at 24 bits. So I'm not going to do the math here for you guys, but you can see the math is pretty simple. It's just the number of bits per sample times the sample frequency. All right. So that is a simple explanation of how we get from analog to digital. Now comes the more difficult part, which is converting from digital um, back to analog. So DAC, digital analog conversion is what that stands for. So this is the weakest link in the chain of any digital audio system. Um, it's reproducing the analog sine wave from the digital bit stream. Right, taking in those ones and zeros and then converting those back to a sine wave looks like the music you started with. Uh, this is because while it is the most important area of transcoding, transcoding is converting between analog and digital. Um, it, it is the most difficult. So like I said earlier, computers are very good at taking an analog value and then converting that to binary. What computers are not so great at and not so efficient and effective at is taking that bit stream and then rebuilding an analog waveform or a sine wave uh, from those, those plots. 
So let's take a closer look at why this is so difficult to do. Um, first thing I will let you guys know that there are some various different competing chipsets out there, and depending upon where you are in the Harman world, um, different brands use different uh, chipsets. So AKM is a popular one, and the DCP555, maybe you're familiar with that product from DSS, that uses the AKM chipsets. Uh, the London and the Lexicon devices uh, use a, a mixture of analog devices and text instruments for the verb round processing. And then Cirrus Logic is used in all the Samsung mobile devices. And then ESX technology is used in Mark Levinson. So, um, like I said before, uh, this is the weakest link in the chain. It's taking these little plots you see up here on the graph on the left and then trying to rebuild that original sine wave or waveform back to its original condition. So, on the right at the top here, you see what is the correct waveform. The problem is, I'm going to try and freehand this just to show you guys how difficult this is for a computer. Um, given that I don't have the best handwriting in the world, right? So if I do this, let's see what color that's going to be. So if I go from here to here, and then here to here, and then here to here, give me just a second to get this drawn up. Well, my annotation has stopped working. Well, well, sorry guys, my annotation has stopped working for me here. Oh well, I'm just going to go with it. So you can kind of get the idea of what we're doing here. We're trying to recreate a sine wave from a bunch of dots here. And that's all the computer has, right? It has these plot points on the graph. So it has to kind of guess to figure out what should really go in the middle and how smooth this should be. And again, this is 44.1, so this would be CD quality. So what a computer is having a hard time with is deciding how to turn this straight line into a curve to recreate the sine wave. That's what all that music is, right? Music is a sine wave at various different frequencies. So the computer has to kind of guess as to how to redraw this as best as possible. It doesn't know what the original sign looks like. All it knows is what the binary values are, the ones and zeros that are coming in to the digital to analog converters into the DAC. That's all it has to go by, are just the stream of ones and zeros. So this is what kind of separates the men from the boys when it comes to a DAC is how well it can kind of forecast how to draw these lines to make it a smooth curve as opposed to just a straight line uh, from plot point to plot point. So question might come up, well, if this is so difficult and there's going to be a loss in signal quality, why convert to digital, right? That seems to be a common question that I get in teaching this is, is why why even go to the trouble of converting to people? And there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is convenience. Let's take a look, for example, sorry guys, an analog device here. So we have this device. So here's a permanent EQ, for example. All right, this is the BSS EQ. This is the three RU, so three rack units is the size of this EQ. And again, that's, that's a limiting factor, right? This is three RU of rack space just for one equalizer. This is a stereo equalizer, two channel. So one is rack space. That's one big problem uh, with doing all this now. And you could certainly still do this. 
Um, even though the analog equivalents are becoming harder and harder to find, and this is a discontinued product from BSS also on the chip. Um, but you could do this all in analog. You could do your dating, your compression, limiting, ducking, equalization. All those processes could be done in the analog realm. But it's going to take up you know, an entire 144 rack to do it. Um, so that's one problem. The other problem is if you're going analog in, analog out, analog in, analog out, all the way down an entire rack full of gear, you're going to induce a lot of noise into the system because every connection point is going to induce noise. Um, each piece of gear itself is going to have some level of noise that induces onto the signal. So by the time you pass through, you know, four or five pieces of gear through a rack, uh, you're going to have a noticeable noise floor um, that wasn't the original signal you started with. So that is one problem with analog. No matter how good the gear is, there's still going to be some analog noise floor there. Now with digital, um, things get much easier. Once I've converted to digital, I can basically just do this and have a complete signal chain here. This is inside of a BSS Blue, Blue 50 processor, which is a one-half one RQ, so it's a one-half rack mount. And if I wanted to add an EQ, and just go in here and say, okay, I want to add a 30-band graphic EQ, and I want it to be two channels. And now I'm done. Now I have the same thing in the digital realm. And I can just drag and drop as many of these in here as I need for every channel of audio that I'm processing. So that are some of the advantages of the digital, how simple and easy and fast it is to build up an entire signal flow um, in the digital realm. But you have to digital first. That's why we're talking about spending so much time on the analog to digital conversion. That's why you want to convert to digital. So let's get back to the slides. So it'll erase my ink there. So the next problem we have to overcome is we always must, we must convert back to analog. There is no loudspeaker driver in the world that can handle ones and zeros and convert that back into music. Loudspeaker drivers do not work that way. Loudspeaker drivers work on sine waves. They don't work on square waves. <laughs> they work on sine waves. You want that cone to move basically up and down inside of the magnet structure. That's what you're trying to do there. So you have to send that loudspeaker a analog signal. So no matter what you've done previous, somewhere in the chain, you have to convert that digital signal, digital bit stream, back to analog. So I just put a check mark up here because yes, you can send analog, but no, you cannot put ones and zeros into a loudspeaker driver. It doesn't know what to do with that. Okay. So that's it for the, the main presentation here. I'm gonna, I'll actually left a lot of time in here for questions because I'm sure there's some specific things you guys want to ask and there's probably some questions in the queue. Um, as we went through this. So I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions. I'll leave my contact information up here on the screen. If you think of a question later on about how to get into the analog world um, versus digital, uh, just simply email me there at l.craneharmon.com. So Laura, uh, do we have some questions in the queue? Um, nothing has come in yet. So just a reminder, everybody, if you do have a question, to submit that either in the chat box or in the Q&A drop-down, and I'll grab it from there and pass it off to Al. Okay, great. So, again, okay. while we're waiting for questions, I can go back here for a second and just kind of dig into some more details here. Do we have a minute? Um, I, did, I did have one come in. Um, the question is, how is this related to DSD? Okay, so early on, I mentioned in our acronyms here that we have an acronym called LPCM, Linear Pulse Code Modulation. So this is the way that we basically take our sine wave and sample it and then convert each sample from an analog voltage measurement to the binary version of that voltage. Like I said, if it's 0.853 volts, we just convert that 
analog value to a decimal value. DSD does it a little bit differently. In DSD, it's basically one bit, so everything is either on or off. And it uses a different method of modulating the signal. So it's basically everything is one bit, there's just lots and lots of bits. So we're talking about kilohertz um, as a sample frequency. So it's basically, um, it uses a form of pulse code modulation, uh, but it doesn't take a, a measurement, convert that, to anal convert that to analog voltage, then measure that, convert that voltage measurement to uh, binary, and then send it down the line. It's always either on or off, which is the width of how long it's on or off. Um, so if you have a bunch of ones, then it's going to be a large area where the signal is on full. And then if it's zero volts, which is the crossing point here, then it would be off and there'd be a bunch of zeros there to make whatever the, the length of time that is at zero. So DSD uses a much higher sample frequency, but everything's one bit as opposed to being 16 bit or 32 bit or 24 bit depth. So that's kind of what DSD is. And the problem with DSD right now is there isn't really a lot of material um, in DSD. And the second problem with DSD is you actually can't do digital signal processing on the DSD. You can transport it and you can stream it, but you can't actually do, you know, gating, limiting, compressing, ducking. Um, all of those algorithms are not built for, for single bit processing. They're built for 24 bit processing or 16 bit processing or 20 bit processing. So that's the biggest differences of DSD. Okay, we have another question. Um, is the major difference with DACs when it comes to modern audio interfaces? Um, actually, I would say no. So let's go back to that comparison chart here of the different manufacturers of the sets. And so I've definitely, you know, done some, some homework on this. And my experience is, that the implementation of the chipset far outweighs the actual chipset that's utilized um, by a given DAC manufacturer. Um, all of these guys make really good DACs. It's just a matter of how it's implemented by the, the third party, whether that be, you know, some Harman brand or um, your, your cell phone provider, your cell phone manufacturer, maybe you have an Apple phone, you know, there's going to be an inexpensive chipset in there, and there's going to be an inexpensive driver components in there uh, for that chipset. And that's what really makes the difference in the overall sound quality and how accurately the music is reproduced um, is an implementation of that chipset, not necessarily the chipset itself. Okay, that's all I have for now. Okay, great. Well, let me just go back to these devices here. So amongst all the Harman brands, as you guys can probably see here, there is no single solution for what is the bit rate and the bit depth. It's just going to depend upon where it's being used. So for example, you're going to start seeing, I think, more and more in the future as more devices start supporting 192. Because what you really want for better quality are more samples. You don't care about increasing this. So right now, remember, this is 16 bits, right? There are 16 ones and zeros here in this word. This is for CD quality again. I can bump this up to 20 bits, and then maybe instead of having, you know, three decimal places, I can go to five decimal places or eight decimal places if I keep going to 20 bit or 24 bit, or now you're even hearing about 32 bit um, word length. So based on my experience in the pro audio world, um, and I have a pretty good ear, I can't tell a difference between 24-bit sampling and 32-bit depth. Um, you can definitely hear a difference between 48 and 96. So I think the focus should really be on increasing the sample frequency, not the bit depth. If everything sticks at 24-bit depth for you know, the next decade, 
I think that's perfectly acceptable. And I don't really see an audible advantage of higher bit depths uh, beyond 24 bit depth. Like I said, I've heard 32 bits compared to 24. And to me, there's, there is no audible difference in, in the outcome. You know, the, the real, the difference comes in how many samples there are, especially at high frequencies, right? It's, it's easy to take, you know, 44,000 samples of a one hertz signal. But when you get up to 20,000 hertz, you know, you're only going to be taking a couple of samples at 44.1, right? Because you only double the sample frequency. So that's where the real benefit comes in higher sample frequencies, you know, 96 kilohertz or 192 kilohertz, is that there are just lots more samples of those high frequencies, you know, even above 10,000 hertz, which is where, you know, all of your treble is, right? Your, your cymbal crashes, higher end piano notes. Uh, the piano actually has the, the, the broadest range of frequencies of all the instruments. So those upper end piano notes are going to be reproduced much more naturally and more accurately with higher and higher sample frequencies. Okay, we have another question. Is noise floor a bigger issue at the input stage? Yes, it is. So if we go back to our slide on the DBX here. Yeah. So here's the DBX processor. So this uh, tube channel strip is a preamp. So what you're bringing in oftentimes is a microphone. This is where you would use this with a microphone, which is a very low level of signal coming in. So whatever noise is on that signal, that's going to be amplified at the preamp level. So this is why I kind of prefer vacuum tubes as preamp. So if you're going to put a vacuum tube anywhere in the signal chain, it really should be um, a very low noise vacuum tube at the preamp stage. Because once you've amplified that noise, it just continues to get amplified all the way down the chain. And it's very difficult to do noise elimination um, in further processing down the signal chain without, without just destroying the actual integrity of the signal um, as it passes through the other devices or other processing objects if you're doing completely digital here. So yes, I would definitely say um, if you're if you're gonna spend you know more effort on the preamp stage, that's gonna benefit you in the long run of the signal chain versus in the amplifier, um, which has your output stage in it. Um, it doesn't matter how clean the amp is if you have a noisy signal coming into it. Okay, we do have another question. Um, in the future, will there be devices that can upscale the sampling frequency? <laughs> so, this is one of those questions that I often get a lot. And the, the simple, the best way to explain the answer is like this. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So, once you've sampled this um, at some given bit rate, let's say you have CD quality, right? Everything is you know, there are thousands and thousands and millions of different CDs out there in the world today. So they've been around since the 80s. So there's, there's plenty of them. Once you've taken that analog signal, converted it to digital, there may be some slight benefits as far as the, the other end, where you convert from the digital back to analog again. But generally speaking, and this is already being done. So the answer to the question, I guess, is, is can it be done in the future? The answer is they're already doing it. There are already systems that take in CD quality 44.1 16-bit and then up convert that actually to DSD. So you could go as high as DSD um, or, you know, 192.24 or something, 192.32 I've seen. Um, so you could do that. And there may be a benefit to the actual DAC chipset itself that it can reproduce this a little bit better. Uh, but for the most part, you want to make sure that the source material is of the highest quality when you actually convert it from analog to digital the first time. Because, you know, if you sample it at a low sample frequency, you sample it to, you know, MP3, right, it's good. It's, it's never going to sound as good as the analog waveform. 
you can ask a follow-up question if you if you need to about that clarification. But it is a good question. Okay, that's all that has come in right now. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to share, Al? Um, let me just go back to my point about the hardware again. Okay. So, different manufacturers and different brands from, from Harman, for example, um, are going to use different chipsets. It's just a matter of how that chipset is implemented um, that really is going to make the difference in sound quality. So, just because, you know, one manufacturer uses AKM, Another, man, another brand may use analog devices. That is not as crucial as that manufacturer's expertise in the actual um, analog output stage. Uh, that's, that's what really makes the difference. So, you know, when you're buying whatever brand X versus brand Y, uh, something to pay attention to is how much effort has gone into the to the actual analog output stage, not just the chipset that they use, because again, there's a limited number of chipset manufacturers in the world, uh, but there's an infinite number of ways of taking that digital signal, um, that analog signal, and then amplifying it to the output stage, even if it is line level output. Um, speaking of output levels, um, some levels that you should probably know on the analog side, uh, generally for consumer audio, we talked about negative 10 decibels. Uh, that's pretty much the standard across the board for consumer um, equipment. Um, a, a standard that you're usually shooting for um, in any sound system is zero dB, what we call a unity gain, so you aren't adding or subtracting from that. Um, everything passes through that unity gain. And then in the pro audio world, which is where Harman sits, um, at least Harman Professional, um, everything there, the signal is actually plus 4 dB for less dBU, so that's unweighted. So that's the, that's the primary differences here. Um, generally speaking, what you're going to find moving forward in this industry is two supported sample frequencies, 48 kilohertz and 96 kilohertz, and pretty much everybody is, is set on 24-bit depth. Um, again, like I mentioned before, there really isn't a, an audible difference <laughs> in going to 32 bit. There's a significant difference in, in the bit rate and the file size and so on, uh, but the, the difference in file size does not pay out uh, relative to the difference in sound quality because to my ears, I can't even hear a difference at all. So I think that pretty well covers it, Well, unless there's any more questions. Yep, we do have a couple more questions. Um, the first one is asking, you're talking about digital audio extraction from a CD to a lossless file and then upconverting or SPDIF. So when you're talking about SPDIF, that is just a medium of transporting that signal. So it's still digital. So for example, take a, take a, a good like a, like a, like a Harman uh, CD player, right, from back in the day. A Harman Kardon CD player might have multiple outputs. So it would have analog outputs, and it would have maybe two different digital outputs. It would have a PCM output and the TOSLink or SPDIF output. So that is still just the bit stream coming out of those digital connectors. But inside the CD player, there's also a digital to analog converter to send it out of your two RCA connectors, the, the red and the white RCAs. Uh, those are your analog outputs. So you will have used the internal um, DAC, digital analog converter, inside of that CD player to convert that down. And you don't know what the quality is of that DAC, right? So you're better off to do uh, TOSLink or, or PCM um, SPDIF output to a higher quality DAC. And, and that is going to make the difference in sound quality. Is, is, is the DAC itself, right? A high quality DAC. And most DACs today, um, they either take in USB, they take in uh, TOSLink, or they take in um, SPDIF. Okay, the next question is asking, what is the sampling frequency and bit depth on the Harman Blue Link audio? So Blue Link 
um, you can actually send Blue Link audio at either 48 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz. You can only, only the uh, BSS 800 series devices, the modular devices support 96 kilohertz sampling. So if you're using a Blue 100, a Blue 101, a Blue 102, those devices only support 48 kilohertz sampling. So there is a difference between which device you're using amongst the BSS um, products. Um, but you can all, and the, by the way, the bit depth is always fixed at 24 bits on Blue Link. So it doesn't matter which type of product it came from. It could be a, a blue USB, right? Take USB out of your computer, get, all, get up onto your Blue Link bus. Um, that's always going to be fixed at 24 bit, and there's no way to adjust it. But the sample frequency can be set to either 24, sorry, can be set to either 48 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz. Okay, the next question is asking if you could please explain the practical examples of where 58 kilohertz and 96 kilohertz are used. Practical example. So, yeah, I would say that generally speaking, the only time you're going to use 96 kilohertz sampling is in recording, mastering, um, or in some cases in live sound. Um, if you're really, you know, just committed to that live sound reinforcement um, being done at the highest level, then you probably just want gear that supports 96 kilohertz sampling. Um, at a concert, can anybody hear a difference if you're standing, you know, 100 feet away listening to one loudspeaker or, you know, one line array? Um, I doubt it. Um, for critical listening environments and for recording, then that's where 96 kilohertz has a value. But outside of those two, in my opinion, I don't really see a need for 96 kilohertz sampling. If you're in a conference room, right, you're doing a meeting on, on, on WebEx or something, um, there really is no, no audible benefit to, to going from 40 to 96 kilohertz. Okay, that looks like it's it for now. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to share, Al? Nope, I think that's it. So that's pretty much a wrap for, for what I have. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you, Al, for presenting. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm just going to share a couple of quick links with you in the chat box. Um, so if you want to take a look there, I'm sharing three different links. One is the link to our um, training calendar that's out on Harmon Professional University. So I had a few questions that came in through the chat box during the session asking about upcoming certification. So if you go to that first link and you register on Harmon Professional University, you get access for free to all of the many hours of curriculum that we have on there. The second link that I'm sharing is another question that comes up often. This is your access to all of the recorded webinars. So every single webinar that we do, we record and we put it out onto this playlist on YouTube. Um, the one that you attended today will also be out there. Give it about three days and we'll get that posted. And then the third link that I just sent to you is the link to our full events calendar. So if you'd like to attend any of our future webinars, you can just go to that link, the full calendar's there, and you can sign up for whatever you'd like. So thanks again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Al. All right, thank you, Laura.